So, ladies and gentlemen, hold your breath as I invite our guest of honor today, Dr. Kalpana Gopalan. Ma'am is an IAS officer. She is composite public policy professional, practitioner, policy maker, scholar, author, volunteer, and mother. She ranked 19 in All India Civil Services Examination 1987. She recognized with seven awards for public service, citations from 14 universities, four fellowships awards for academic work, and felicitations from nine institutions. Ma'am, it's an honor to have you. Please enlighten us with your words. Thank you so much, Manoj. And uh, so glad uh, to share the dais with you once again, Varad. Uh, it's a great pleasure. Nice to see you informally attired on a Saturday morning. And uh, Ms. Nishid, uh, whatever you said resonated with me. And uh, I hope that in my address, I'm able to uh, touch upon some of the points of uh, that reluctance and hesitation which you mentioned and which is so true of uh, women entrepreneurs today, particularly in our country. Uh, so uh, I have uh, titled my talk, Ladies Mean Business. And so that is what I'm going to touch, touch upon today. Thank you to the organizers and welcome to all my sisters gathered here. Each time I'm asked to address a gathering of women, I go through a period of inner conflict and introspection. What do I say? What is the message that I ought to convey? Should I be enthusiastic and encouraging, reassuring my audience that all will be well, that only if we want something hard enough and believe in ourselves and a greater providence genuinely enough, all our dreams will come true? Or do I adopt a more realistic, hard-hitting stance, calling spades spades and discrimination discrimination at the risk of frightening of my, half my audience and antagonizing the other half? Finally, I always, as I have today, settle for a balanced pragmatism. Let me begin with a reality check. We, women entrepreneurs, do not lead. If we look at the entrepreneurial ecosystem as a whole, women are just a minuscule part of it. They constitute only about 14% of the total entrepreneurs. That is about 8 million out of the 60 million entrepreneurs in the country. Established owned by women provide employment to just about 15 to 20 million people, probably less after COVID. Women comprise about 30% of corporate senior management positions in India, and that is not notably higher than the global average of about 25%. But the percentage of women on corporate boards, that is in policy and decision-making positions, is just about 15%. And many of them are wives, sisters, and mothers, which are great of the promoters, which greatly dilutes their independence and their effectiveness. So, despite today's event and its color and vibrancy, we do not lead, at least not yet. We have a long journey to make before we can truly take leadership in our hands. But then, isn't that how leaders evolve? By making that journey from a no to an S. So my role today is cut out for me. My responsibility as a speaker today is to give you some suggestions, some pointers, which may help you navigate your way in this journey. First, seek and search information, information, information is key. Be a seeker and a repository of knowledge. A woman entrepreneur has to familiarize herself with all the different opportunities, assistance, schemes, 
programs and institutions that are available to encourage women's entrepreneurship. And here the gain can help you. Generally, Indians as a whole, and Indian women in particular, tend to rely on family or friends or their cousins, brother-in-law, sister-in-law for information. Well, there is no need to drop off the grip point. After all, there's a great pleasure in human interaction. But as an entrepreneur, it is essential that you go above and beyond it. The internet is the great source of information. In fact, the best and the easiest of access. Score government websites for information. Not just the startup websites, but different departmental websites of the central and the state governments. For instance, Stand Up India facilitates bank loans for women entrepreneurs. TRED provides women with trade related training, information, counseling, and grants. Karnataka has industrial policies specially tra tailored for women. In fact, there's a whole chapter on women entrepreneurship in the policy. You should also familiarize yourself with local, national, and global macroeconomic trends, price fluctuations, inflation, everything, the whole hog. Economics may appear as a boring subject or a difficult subject from the outside, but once you get your teeth into it, it can be engrossing. I also notice a tendency, even among educated women, a tendency to skip numbers, anything arithmetical, mathematical, or statistical. Well, don't. Notice, I specifically said educated women. The vegetable vendor in Basavanagudi or the flower seller in my neighborhood temple are natural number crunchers, and you should be too. So, Seek, search, and gather information. That is the first ingredient in my recipe. My second ingredient is sharing. When we speak of women leading in entrepreneurship as well as in other spheres of life and work, it is important that we capitalize on our strengths, our competitive advantage, so to say. One important strength that we women have our particular competitive advantage is sisterhood. Don't confuse this with the water cooler or locker room gossip of men. Our sisterhood goes beyond borders. There is an instant bond, a connection between women, regardless of where we come from or what language we speak. We must build on this and definitely not let it be clouded by envy or backbiting. Everyone will have some black spots in their lives, some skeletons in their cupboards. How does it matter? Someone's husband has a girlfriend, someone's brother is a drunk, someone's daughter didn't get admission in Columbia University. Does it matter? We are professionals, we are women. Let us help each other through our struggles and our strife. If I can give one single reason for where I am today, it is by avoiding all negativity, all envy, all malice from my words and actions, even when I am being hurt or harmed. Let me share an example with you. Some years ago, I was working in an organization where I fell foul of my boss. His way of getting back at me was to isolate me completely and deprive me of work entirely. My subordinates were instructed not to submit any files or papers to me. And the entire organization, which was about 60,000 strong, mind you, the entire organization was unofficially instructed not to approach me for any reason whatsoever. So much so that when one officer wanted to invite me for his son's marriage, he was too scared to come and meet me. So he met my husband and gave him the invitation. 
At that time, I was handling HR, human resources. So you can understand how untenable the situation became. How could I manage people that I could not meet? At that time, something happened. A cleaning lady used to come into my chamber every day. She was used to seeing me with lots and lots of work and always busy and in a hurry. And suddenly here I was alone in my chamber day after day with no work and no people and a lot of time on my hands and an old rickety desktop computer for company. Now this lady did not understand office politics. But she asked me one day, you are looking so bored, more tired than when you were working late nights. Why don't you read something? Why don't you write something? She just said in Canada actually, that is what she said. And that was the trigger that I needed. I sat and wrote a paper, a study of Bangalore city, its growth and its conflicts. And then I sent it off to an international conference. It got accepted and I got an all expenses paid trip to present the paper in a prestigious university in the UK. When I came back, my boss had learned his lesson and all was well. So my pointer to you is share, nourish sisterhood, mentor other women, be a giver. For me, that lady, that cleaning lady, in her innocence and kindness, she became my driver that, in that uh, episode. You will grow like me along with your sisters. My third proposition to you is be socially responsible. We tend to get caught up with ourselves, our life, our troubles. These things will always be there. There is only one way to overcome this, and that is by giving a hand to someone else. When I was administering the literacy program in the state, the Sakshirata Andolana, as it was called, my most joyous moments came when I attended literacy groups of poor, underprivileged or tribal women. They used to attend classes in the late evenings, after work, after physical labor. But when they read out the alphabet or signed their name, their eyes shining with the light of accomplishment, it gave me a feeling of fulfillment that I will remember forever. I believe therefore in personal social responsibility as distinct from corporate social responsibility or the public responsibility of governments. PSR, is the responsibility each of us has as citizens and human beings to give back to our communities. I fulfill my PSR by sharing my learning as a speaker and as a mentor to youth and service organizations. My talks help me to reach out to a larger audience and touch the hearts and minds of youth. Let me give you an example. Meera Suresh. Meera was in the audience when I spoke on entrepreneurship to the students of Rajgiri Business School in Kochi. A few years later, uh, uh, about a year later, she connected with me on LinkedIn. And this is what Meera's message said. Madam, you came to Rajgiri Business School, Kochi, to address the gathering and talk about empowerment and entrepreneurship. And I'm quoting from her message. I was among those students who keenly listened to your words. And it not only gave me some good time, but also helped me to start my own venture. Today, I have started my journey, a zero financial investment project with a whole women team. And we named it Wordsmith. Thank you, ma'am, for the fire that you have filled in us. This is Mira's message that I quoted to you. And Mira's organization still continues and flourishes. So take up a course, adopt a school, grow a tree, 
teach a child. Conduct your business not just efficiently, but ethically. Just as personal qualities of truth and positivity are important, so too social qualities such as environmental consciousness or a social conscience are important. So my dear sisters and brothers gathered here, you will understand that for me, entrepreneurship goes beyond and above the corporate world and above and beyond success in a limited sense of setting up a firm or a unit. Seeking and gathering information and knowledge, sharing and building a sisterhood, and developing a social consciousness and being socially responsible. These are the recipes for our success as entrepreneurs. They involve a growth and change of our personalities and the transformation of the ecosystem that nourishes us and which we too have to nurture. Then we will lead. We will lead not just as entrepreneurs, corporate entrepreneurs, but as social entrepreneurs as well. Thank you all. Good luck in your journey. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, ma'am. It was great uh, hearing that this is the, what you have faced and what you have learned about social and work life balance. Oh, Manoj, and, may, I, may I just button for a moment? Yeah, because, yeah, uh, ma'am, yeah, ma'am. Yes, uh, ma'am. Before I leave, just wanted to say but it's been uh, really extraordinary and uh, in a way moving to listen to the panelists because this is coming from, you know, uh, this is from uh, coming from people whose hearts and souls and minds are, have been on that job. And uh, they've done it and they've shown us. And about that work-life balance, I think we will miss the wood for the trees when we start chasing labels like this. The, uh, the ultimate goal is fulfillment and happiness. And uh, if work gives you fulfillment, and happiness. I was just telling a friend this morning that I love working so much that, uh, you know, uh, I, my uh, fond, my greatest wish is that I should drop dead working because I enjoy it so much and I don't mind what work it is, uh, uh, whether it's I'm teaching or whether I'm doing my uh, you know, service or even if I'm doing jadu pocha. Uh, you know, it gives me great joy. And uh, if if I have one prayer that I want that when I am working, I should just drop down it. So where is this label? It should give uh, that fulfillment and happiness. And uh, as uh, one of the panelists pointed out, your children are seeing you, and they are imbibing that. And they then they are not seeing work as something which is you know something which you should balance it or you no know, arithmetically make compartmentalizations but something that actually gives you happiness and something which you can derive joy from. And that is actually the ultimate goal. So uh, work-life balance is great, but let's not miss the wood for the trees or you know, you know throw away the baby with the bathwater. What we are seeking is happiness and fulfillment. If that gives, work gives you that, then it's great. Sorry to button, but uh, you know, it was so, what uh, the panelists were saying was resonating so much, I just wanted to say something. So true, Mom. Indeed, it's a very personal thing with everyone, I guess, who are working. Uh, so, moving.